Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Center for Peace Communications, I'm Joseph Browdy. Welcome to Encounters, our biweekly series of webinars about how to promote civic engagement and tolerance across borders of identity uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, three years ago, a remarkable book was published called Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor that turned out to be much more than a book. Uh, Yossi Klein Halevi was the author, and he set out to begin a kind of a dialogue, uh, a dialogue of strength and a dialogue of empathy, whereby he would not only um, e explain his own people's narrative, that of the Israeli people, the dilemmas they face, and even look inward and, uh, and be a bit self-critical, but also manifest curiosity and openness to his Palestinian neighbors. Um, the book was published in English and Arabic and hundreds of Palestinians responded uh, to what he wrote with letters of their own. And it began a new process and one might even say the beginnings of a new type of engagement between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, I think it took a lot of courage to pull that off and a lot of creativity and both those qualities are sorely lacking in so much of the region, including Israel and the Palestinian areas, but also the broader region where conflict over identity is tearing nations apart. So we thought that it would be worth hearing from Yossi directly and learning about his experience and also exploring it um, more broadly and looking at its potential relevance in other arenas of conflict across the Middle East and North Africa. So I'm pleased to introduce a very interesting panel of distinguished guests. The first, Yossi Klein Halevi, is uh, not only a celebrated author, but also a senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. He'll be joined by Hussein Abdul Hussein, an Iraqi Lebanese journalist and uh, Washington bureau chief of the Kuwaiti newspaper Ra'i. Uh, Ruya Hakakian is a, an Iranian-American author uh, and a poet and a journalist with a following in Iran and uh, quite an audience here in the United States as well. Nirvana Mahmoud, uh, born a daughter of Egypt, uh, active in uh, both the Egyptian discussion and in the country where she lives today, the UK, uh, is a writer and essayist concerned with women's issues civil society and religious reform. And finally, Rebar Salahuddin Abdullah, a native of Suleymaniyah in Northern Iraq, who devotes his life to uh, navigating and mitigating um, identity-based conflict, particularly in the Kurdish areas. So I'm delighted that all of you have been able to join us today. And I'd like to begin by asking Yossi, to walk us through your experience, Yossi, of writing letters, of uh, reading responses, and of the relationships that emerged from that back and forth. Well, uh, hi, everyone. And uh, Joseph, thank you for your, your warm introduction. Thank you for convening this, this wonderful group. And, uh, and for your vision, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for, for all that you do. And, uh, and thank you, fellow panelists, for really for honoring me with your, your presence here. And uh, delighted to, uh, to be with you all. Uh, the book, uh, Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, uh, was really an attempt to try to, in some sense, circumvent the deadlock uh, on the diplomatic and political front and open up a person-to-person -person conversation. Uh, take advantage of social media, uh, take advantage of the fact that <clears throat> even though my book could never be published uh, in probably any Arab country today, uh, it can appear on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the web and be offered for free downloading, which is exactly what I did. I, I translated letters into Arabic, uh, put it on uh, online, and uh, probably about 5,000 Arabic speakers, including uh, many Palestinians, have downloaded the book so far. 
And um, many hundreds have responded with, uh, with emails, uh, with Facebook posts, and creating a conversation that would have been impossible 15 years ago. Simply, the technology didn't exist. And so this is an attempt to really take advantage of, uh, of the transformation uh, of, uh, of the culture and to, um, and to promote a direct conversation. And the, the book is a series of 10 letters written to an anonymous Palestinian neighbor on, symbolically speaking, on the next hill from where I live. I live literally uh, in the last row of houses uh, at the edge of Jerusalem. The West Bank begins on the next hill. We are divided by the security barrier, by the wall. And I look out on a very complicated landscape. I, on the one hand, there's this expanse, the desert, these beautiful villages, Palestinian villages on the next hill. And then there's the wall which blocks communication, physical communication between us. But it turns out that there are ways of circumventing that wall. <laughs> and so this book really was an attempt to see whether anyone on the next hill, and again, I'm speaking metaphorically, on all the hills beyond, beyond the wall, uh, would respond to this book. I wrote this to explain who the Jewish people are, why we came back to this land, why we believe that this land that we share with the Palestinian people is also our land, why we believe, why I believe that there are two indigenous peoples in this land who must figure out a way of respecting each other's story. And so I told the Jewish people's story very much through a personal lens, through my own story. And I invited Palestinians and really anyone in the region for that matter uh, to read the book and respond with their own story, with their own narrative. Now, I should note that, that what gave me, I'd say the, uh, the chutzpah, which has become an English word, it, <laughs> what has given me the arrogance to presume uh, the right to tell my neighbor my story is that about 20 years ago, I went on a year long journey into Palestinian society, into, into mosques in the West Bank, in Gaza, something which is inconceivable today, uh, with a kippah going into mosques. And it was a journey of trying to learn the Palestinian story listening to my neighbors, trying to learn something of the beauty of Islam and the complexities of the Palestinian story. And that was a journey that, uh, that was a journey of listening and learning. And I wrote a book about that journey. It was published in 2001 called At the Entrance to the Garden of Eden. And in some sense, I felt that this book uh, was a sequel. Uh, in that journey, I tried to listen, and in this journey, I tried to explain. But I also felt that it wasn't enough to simply tell my story. I needed to listen to the Palestinian story or stories, and to be willing to incorporate the Palestinian stories in my telling. And so the paperback edition of the book, which came out uh, in 2019, uh, includes a, a new epilogue, a 50-page epilogue, letters from Palestinians to their Israeli neighbor. And including their letters in the book was in one sense a very easy decision, and another, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, and another way a very difficult decision. It, I knew that I would want to include letters from Palestinians in the next edition of the book, but I wasn't sure whether I would be giving the Palestinian responses the last word in my book. That was a very difficult decision. 
<laughs> because I wrote this book to explain and to defend the Israeli story. By giving the Palestinian counter story the last word, I risked undermining the, the argument that I was making. And I realized in the end that I have no choice if I'm serious about modeling a different kind of conversation between Palestinians and Israelis. I must give the Palestinian voice the last word in my book. It was a very painful decision. And it's not the way, as all of you know, uh, it's not the way politics uh, is conducted, political debates are conducted in our time anywhere, certainly not in America, certainly not in the Middle East. But I felt this desperate need to signal to my Palestinian neighbors, first of all, that I honor those who had the courage to respond, regardless of what they thought of my book. And some of the responses that I publish are very harsh. But I felt that the need to, first of all, honor those voices, and secondly, to publish a book that would model what a respectful disagreement over irreconcilable historical narratives would sound like. Palestinians and Israelis will never agree over who is responsible for the refugee crisis of 1948, uh, who is responsible for the collapse of the Oslo peace process. These are fundamental disagreements. But in the same way that neither people is going to disappear, neither narrative is going to disappear either. And for 70 years, we have been fighting a war of narratives where each side not only tries to prove the legitimacy of its story, but tries to fundamentally discredit the legitimacy of the other side's story. And the other side's story is very deep, it's very powerful, and it's not going away. And so just as we're going to need to learn to live between the river and the sea, between two indigenous peoples, we're going to also need to learn how to live with two indigenous narratives that deeply conflict. And so my goal here was not to find agreement, but to figure out a way of how do we create a space where we can disagree with each other with respect, where we can listen to each other's stories. Now, again, I'm not a politician. I'm not a diplomat. I'm just a writer. But a writer's responsibility is to work with language. And that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to create a language that might be useful for those of us who are caught in this. And if I could just have one or two more minutes, Joseph, to, to finish sure. up. Sure, go ahead, go ahead. Just say, say yeah. a word about the language that I've, I've tried to, to bring in. And Joseph, you touched on, on the first principle here, which is to, at the, on the one hand, stand firmly within your own story within your own people's narrative, but that's your starting point, it's not your end point. Your end point is reaching out to the other narrative without for a moment forfeiting the integrity of your own story. So that's the first principle. The second, and I feel that this is especially important uh, in the Middle East, is to speak in a language of faith and a language that honors my own religious faith and that accommodates my neighbor's faith. To make peace in the Middle East, we are going to need to speak a religious language or at the very least accommodate that voice which has not been present at the negotiating table in the past. And, um, and finally, in order to, to to try to make peace, one needs to, in some sense, become peace. And this is a very difficult process. It's a lifetime of struggle. And by that, I mean looking at oneself and being honest with oneself. What are the elements 
the obstacles in my personality that block me from embodying the spirit of peace. And that really, I think, is, is, is the deeper way of, of peacemaking. It's not a question of finding the right political solution. It comes out of a struggle with one's own demons. And I've been struggling with my demons, my Jewish rage, my, my historical traumas uh, my whole life. And how do I overcome those demons and allow myself to become a credible uh, vehicle for peace? So with that, I'll, uh, I'll pass the baton. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience and, and your motivation, Yossi, in, in, in launching what became a meaningful new kind of engagement uh, of, on the issue of narrative and through narrative among Israelis and Palestinians. We're going to try and do a couple of quick lightning rounds to engage the entire panel. And the first is concerned with the question of the relevance of your approach um, and this fundamental idea that you have about empathic narrative exchange in other parts of this region. So Rebar Salahuddin Abdullah, I'd like to ask you about Iraq generally and Kurdistan in particular, a country that uh, historically was one of the most diverse in the world, not two different narrative identities, but certainly well over a dozen of them, uh, a history of amity at the finer moments of Iraqi history that somehow um, has come to an end or nearly so with many lost communities. So is there an effort within Kurdistan that you see as in some way analogous to what Yossi has described or is such a, an effort wanting? So please paint a picture for us. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Joseph, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about, for example, talking about all the whole picture in Iraq, then uh, I will jump uh, into Kurdistan specifically. Uh, recently, what is going on in Iraq? We have two main like nationalities, Kurdish and Arabs, and also two main like uh, religious shrines, Sunni and Shi. Unfortunately, the, in the in the last uh, like in the last two decades, we, we have like growing this kind of rage or this kind of misunderstanding between the the, the two nationalities or the the, the two groups. And as a result that we can see nowadays, we have a huge social segregation between the, the, the communities still. And going to Kurdistan, I'm talking about the, the, the picture or the, the overall image of the, of the region. Uh, we have like a few minorities, Kakis, Baha'is, and also Yazidis, Zoroastrians, and over also Islam as a majority. And unfortunately, we, we, we don't see this kind of ground, I mean, this kind of understanding or kind of empathy uh, between the, the, the group is. And the reason is uh, what, what, what I understand so far, what according to my investigation and my, my study is the, the, the lack of understanding or misunderstanding from the very beginning, from the education, uh, misunderstanding or awareness regarding the other's uh, values. Uh, both tangible and intangible values. For example, I uh, explained earlier that the, 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 uh, the Kaki or the, the Yarsanis, they have, uh, they have one pile in their religion is a music, which is very, very important. If the people from the other sides knew about this very small practice, they may rethink about them before sending them to hell, before banishing them. Uh, I agree with, with, with Yossi. Yeah, it will not be a kind of totally like uh, being agree with the others, but you will have the chance or you will give them the chance to sit and have a kind of uh, emotion or compassion or discussion together. Because uh, in the past, we were like that. We are not trying to invent something new. We are not trying to be creative. We are trying to go in back if, if we could. Because uh, unfortunately, so far, we don't have this serious attempt in the region. Uh, whether it is because of the political sphere or because of the 
kind of recognition, you know, it, it became like very, very widespread that people recognize or identify themselves with a certain nationality or a certain religion. Now this became a certain type of like a financial condition. So this kind of identification grew or uh, promote the, 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 the segregation between the, 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 the groups or the local communities. Uh, this is the, uh, more or less, I, I, I cannot general, generalize all the, the, the conditions. There is a trivial, I mean, still there is a, a trivial attempt there and there we can see that people are trying to like uh, work for the heritage, recognize the heritage of the minorities and the others. Also, uh, from the other side of the spectrum, I mean, inside the families of the minorities, they are trying to uh, raise or they are trying to infuse the, the, the idea or the notion uh, of a very, very like uh, traditional stereotype of Muslims in, in, in the country. Even Muslims have very nice things, very like, especially when it comes to the architecture, their art, their music. But no, this kind of like, cutting each other, making this barrier that Yossi mentioned about the physical barrier, but we are here in, in, in Kurdistan or in, in KRG, we are building a, a, like non-physical barriers, which is, which is more, more in, in our perspective, which is more dangerous or is more threatening than the, the physical barriers because physical barriers suddenly or eventually you can destroy it with, 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 a, with a, some of equipment, but how you can deal with the non-physical or metaphysical barriers that you are creating without. Thank and, you, uh, yes, uh, thanks yeah. for that overview. And clearly, um, actually, when I spoke with Nirvana Mahmoud uh, yesterday, I think that Nirvana, you spoke of, of in essence, of this notion of a non-physical barrier. And you had some ideas, particularly with respect to your native Egypt, which you felt were also relevant elsewhere about the roots of that uh, non-physical barrier and how it was constructed and, and who perpetuates it. So can you share sort of your view of, um, of what it is that blocks empathy uh, by way of example in Egypt? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there is a, a huge uh, phenomena, I call it social Islamism, which is prevalent not just in Egypt, but also in the rest of the Arab countries. Uh, this ideologically based phenomena is not necessarily going side by side by the political views of those groups, but they all share a common um, uh, view, um, uh, view or narrative, particularly toward uh, minorities and women. They find an empathy as a word is, I hate to say is a dirty word because they see it as a word linked to agenda. Why you want empathy? What do you want to achieve from empathy? So if I am going to have empathy toward the Jews then I am going to accept Israel. So no, thank you very much. I don't want to do that. Then I'm not going to go down that line. If I'm going to accept the Copts, uh, as equal citizen, then I am going to uh, uh, embrace uh, secularism and no, thank you very much, I don't want that. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it creates a society indulging in victimhood and see the majority as the real minority, as the victims. And the minority, the actual minorities, whatever they are, Copts, Armenian, Kurds, uh, Israel, Jewish, you name it, as a threat to the majority, as the evil people. I will tell you one thing, for, in, for example, just to highlight this, in 2013, after the removal of Morsi in Egypt, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, president, they went and burned churches. This is not just because they perceive the Copts as supporting the coup, but also because there was a genuine belief among many people in those embrace, embracing social Islamism that the Copts are hiding weapons in their churches. So the churches is not just seen as a place of worship, but also seen as a place of, uh, a, a, you know, preparing a war against the Muslim majorities. Uh, and that's why uh, 
Copts have been attacked in Libya, uh, Copts have been attacked in Sinai, uh, and they do that without even a sense of mercy. Uh, they also important to understand that there is a deep, uh, all the subsequent governments have denied the problem, have denied its existence. That's why all our education system doesn't even handle that anywhere near. Uh, but also it's important to highlight, it is deep down since the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire see that the perfect way of coexistence is isolating the minorities in their neighborhood. That's why we have the term Hara, Hart, the, the allies of the Jews, the allies of the Kurds, or even in cities, there are streets uh, designated to certain sect of Christianities. The Armenian have their quarters. The Jewish have a prevalent in certain areas. That not necessarily happened in Egypt, but due, due to different uh, evolution of the, uh, of the country. But nonetheless, that is how they see the society can survive, that the, we don't want to know anything about those people. Let them live in there and run by their own rules, but they stay out of us. And that creates a huge barrier in understanding conflicts uh, and also understanding the, what is the problem in our part of the world. And I get there to say the Armenian genocide, and I would love to hear what Roy had you know, talk about the Armenian issue is partly because of that lack of empathy and lack of desire to mix with the Armenian and always see them as part of the enemy, if that makes sense. Thank you, Nirvana. And Hussein Abdul Hussein, I'm, I'm going to guess that some of what uh, Nirvana just described resonates uh, with you as you look at Lebanon, uh, the ethnic and sectarian uh, diversity of the country, and yet the fractious and fractured nature at the same time. Yesterday or the other day, you told me that there are pockets of cosmopolitan Beirut in which the kind of empathy Yossi pursues uh, is present. Uh, and yet uh, elsewhere in the, in the country, uh, it's an altogether different reality. And the stigmatization of empathy uh, is, is, is a very strong force. So walk us through um, sort of the, the, the map of empathy or lack thereof uh, in Lebanon. Thanks, uh, Joseph. Let me start uh, by saying, Yossi, Yossi talk, talked about um, uh, the conflict and narratives between the uh, uh, Jews and, and the Palestinians in Israel. Uh, and this has been going on for 70 years. Uh, if it makes dear Yossi feel any better, there's a, a conflict in narrative between the Sunni and Shia that's been going on for 1400 years. And it's, and it's not even near being resolved. So this is how this region was designed. Who designed it? Nirvana says the Ottomans, I'm not a fan, but I'm not sure they did it. They probably just um, uh, re-entrenched. They, they probably just reinforced what was there. And absolutely, Nirvana is absolutely right that the segregation is still there. It's not only between Jews and Arabs, it's between everyone, Sunnis and Shia and Muslims and Christians. And even within the Christian camp, there are the Greek Orthodox and the Maronite Catholics, and then the, 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 the Latin Catholics. So all these uh, communities do not really mix. And if you ever notice that in, in most of, of the Arab countries, no one says uh, life, liberty, and equality, like the French slogan. Everyone talks about coexistence instead of equality. And the difference is huge because coexistence assumes that these are communities coexistence, coexisting. It does not mean that these are individual who, who enjoy, individuals who enjoy equal rights. So in Lebanon, if you look at, at the Bikaa Valley in the east, it has many uh, communities, Shia, Sunni, uh, Christian. The interesting thing is that you know each village. There's a village that's only Christian. There's a village that's only Sunni. Bekha is mostly Shia, but then if you're driving through Shia villages and you pass by Arsal, everyone knows that Arsal is Sunni. So this segregation exists. And I think this makes talking to one another, uh, makes normalization hard. And we have to keep in mind that, like Nirvana said, this is also social. So intermarriage is frowned upon. Even when it's legally allowed between the Sunnah and the Shia, it is frowned upon uh, in Lebanon and Iraq and these countries. 
the the metropolitan exp experiment that we we talked about is to an extent limited in Lebanon, maybe in Iraq, in 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 Cairo. There there are you know some signs that this metropolitan pocket sometimes produces cross cultural uh, elites who intermarry, who are mostly secular, and because these come to live together and they come to mix, unlike the villages where everyone is just sitting, sticking to their own sect and village. In the cities, uh, in, in Beirut in particular, in Ras Beirut, which is a, a, a big district in Beirut, in Ras Beirut where the American University of Beirut is, there's a, a big uh, a secular, non-segregated uh, community that's, uh, that's also tolerant. That's, that's tolerant to the idea of peace and uh, idea of talking to the other. And this is the community that I come from. This is where I grew up or why, where, where the college I went to. So this really helps. And it's unfortunate that this is, this is very limited. And what happens is that if you look at election results, if we take Egypt, for example, you will see that the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood never, never won Cairo. They mostly won the countryside where everyone is segregated, but in Cairo, they lost time and again. And this happens even in, in Lebanon, if you take the Bekaa Valley and it's mostly Shia, and if you take Baalbek, which is a big Shia city in the Bekaa Valley, and you will see that Hezbollah rarely or never wins the mayoral election or any kind of election. Hezbollah depends on the segregated countryside, the villages that are purely ethnic, racial, tribal, you name it. So this is the, the, uh, this is the formula, this is the arrangement that we have, that we have to deal with. And of course, that we're trying to, uh, that we're debating here and trying to, to resolve or, or to find ways of how to make the countryside look more like the big cities throughout the region. Thank you, Hussein. Ruya, uh, you of course are a, um... An Iranian, a native of Iran, and uh, and a Jewish Iranian who has been striving uh, for so many years to foster uh, intra-Iranian dialogue on the Jewish-Muslim level, uh, engagement among Iranians of the two faiths, um, and yet, of course, that is sorely tested and challenged, and the potential for doing so under the regime in Tehran today is is, you know severely challenged, and yet um, you've developed some ideas about what might be necessary to overcome that obstacle, and you see the diaspora as playing some role. So walk us through uh, you know, the extent to which you're hopeful, um, but also the problems you see. Hi. Um, thank you, Joseph, and everyone else. Um, I'd like to uh, just make uh, one thing clear that I set out to write and, and simply tell my own story. Everything else that has come about as a result of it is just, uh, you know, uh, additional uh, benefits of, of taking that single step. Um, I wasn't initially trying to address any sort of communal uh, issues or problems. It was a uh, it was just a matter of feeling compelled uh, to tell um, or to account for certain narratives that I thought were threatened or were on the verge of disappearing. And that's all what I initially tried to do. Um, I say that because I think in, in um, situations where dictatorships become ubiquitous, um, uh, the, the uh, effort to try to uh, record truths um, as we experience them uh, becomes a huge challenge. And that's really initially what drew me uh, to writing my memoir and, and the subsequent books that I have. Um, and I think in some ways that's enough um, to do. And, and in some ways that's precisely what Yossi tried to do. Um, the best thing we can do is to start by, by telling our own individual stories and our own individual experiences and hope that that can provide a way of then interacting. Um, however, in the process, I discovered that something um, uh, that this 
a very strange situation of being in exile or in diaspora provides us that, that it never occurs to us because once we are driven out of our homelands, um, it is the grief of being away that, that takes over. That, that we think only about the loss. But I think this diaspora creates a very strange opportunity too. Um, we are here, these, these small minority communities uh, that never had an opportunity to interact with the majority um, now live under democratic circumstances uh, in the US, in Europe, in, you know, in parts of the Western world. And this suddenly provides us um, you know, these communities that have always been kept separate from each other, and these communities whose narratives have always been hijacked by, by those who uh, claim to know those narratives or claim to be the, the owners of those narratives, um, now have a chance to actually interact, to, to tell each other uh, what they saw and how they saw each other and how, wish, how they wish to be seen by the other. And, and that's where I think um, being in diaspora, in this particular case for the Iranian community, presents a, an exceptional opportunity. It presents a, a chance where, you know, Jewish Iranians, Christian Iranians, Baha'i Iranians, who um, are by, by virtue of the Iranian constitution at the moment, uh, have been relegated to second class citizenship, uh, talk to uh, majority Iranians, some of whom are as big victims as the rest of our, uh, uh, the rest of us are, right? Some of whom have been secular, you know, socialist Iranians who have had to abandon the country just as the rest of us. However, the exercise of uh, this sort of dialogue that, that being in Iran doesn't allow us uh, will provide us with a microcosm of an exercise that will then not only foster a relationship we have never had within the country, but also a relationship that can be hopefully someday replicated inside the country. And that's something that I think um, we ought to attempt to do. Thank you, Roya. Uh, Yossi, I'm going to turn to each of the panelists again in a moment and challenge them to think about um, what it might look like to take a small step to overcome the obstacles or in that direction that they've described. But first, I'd like to invite you to react to all of this. Certainly, you've heard some parallels to the Israeli-Palestinian dynamic, but also you know, so many contrasts. So give us your read on, uh, on what you've just heard. So if I could very briefly respond to each of the uh, really superb presentations and uh, just in, in, in a, few, a few words about each. Uh, Rebar, listening to you really reminds me about the major difference I'd say between, uh, one of the major differences between uh, the Middle East and the West. You know, in America, when you want to say that something is irrelevant, you say, oh, that's history. In the Middle East, when you say that's history, people are interested. Oh, that's history. That's my story. That's me. And so uh, that's really, I, I think, a, an added incentive for, uh, in the context of our Middle Eastern conflicts, of creating a space where people feel that their histories uh, are being honored and, and that it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, that, and that was really my feeling uh, uh, listening to you, Nirvana, uh, about how the Muslim Brotherhood uh, has reacted to, uh, to, uh, to the Copts, to democratization, uh, with this fear that if they give in, they're going to lose their essence, they're going to lose their identity. And I think that that's a really important point to, to keep in mind, uh, that empathy is not a zero-sum game. Uh, and that's going to really require, again, a, a, a modeling of how, of how that works. Um, I, I also think, uh, Nirvana, that you, you, you raise a very important and disturbing element, uh, which is true, I suspect, in running through many of our conflicts, and that's a, a tendency toward conspiracy theories. And what you, when you spoke about the, the, the fear 
uh, that the Copts are using their churches to hoard weapons. Now, anyone who knows the Copts uh, know just how, how fearful they are and, uh, and how defensive they are and how ludicrous it is to suspect them of hoarding weapons. Uh, it goes against their, their, their culture, their, their sense of themselves in Egyptian society. Uh, but, it, but the perception is stronger than the reality. Uh, Hussein, you raise a very interesting question and uh, challenge, really, of whether uh, coexistence depends uh, on physical mingling. Uh, is that a prerequisite? Uh, and, uh, and you as well, Roya, raise in some sense the same, the same question. Uh, how, how do we expand the, the model of empathy? That's another uh, question that I hear you, Hussein, raise, which is that you do have models of coexistence and empathy, uh, and of equality, to use your, your language, Hussein. You have those models in Lebanon, but they're geographically restricted. So how does one create, how do you take those models and rather than make them in some ways anomalies, how do you, how do you turn an exception into, into a model? Uh, I tried to do that with my book through going in multimedia directions. Uh, we created a film, for example, based on uh, my relationship with one of the Palestinian respondents Professor Mohammad Dajani, we created a, a, a brief film that has gone out and uh, with, of course, uh, Arabic subtitles. And, and, um, and so I, I don't know beyond, beyond the tools that I have as a, as a writer, as a communicator, I don't know what I can do, but I think that each of us really needs to think of how do we expand the reach of, uh, of the model that Hussein was speaking about. Uh, and finally, Roya, you, you, um, you reminded me that uh, a project that I'm involved in uh, is, is really dealing, and, and is, which is bringing Muslim American leaders to Jerusalem to study Judaism, Israel, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict from multiple perspectives. Uh, is uh, we, we actually thought very much of reaching out to the American uh, Shia um, uh, diaspora. And uh, my brother in the, and, and partner in this project, Imam Abdullah Antepli, who is on the call, uh, Abdullah uh, is head of Muslim affairs at Duke University and is really the initiator of this project that I've been involved in, uh, the Muslim Leadership Initiative, MLI, uh, had, uh, we, 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 uh, we very much had in mind uh, this possibility of, uh, of a cohort that would be composed of, uh, of Iranian Americans. So maybe that's something, uh, Roya, that you and I can, can discuss further. So uh, thank you all uh, for really for getting me going. And I feel that it's just, I feel very frustrated because I want to engage each of you now in a, in a very long conversation. Thank you, Yossi. Well, in that spirit, uh, Raybar, let me start with you. Uh, it strikes me that Suleimania, for all of the challenges that you've described, uh, is a space in which public action remains possible. Um, and so I'd like you to just very swiftly envision, paint a picture of, of what you might do if you had the resources uh, and the time to uh, attempt to catalyze empathy uh, in your hometown. What would, what would such a venture look like? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I would like to try to be a little bit uh, scientific and research-based with, 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 uh, with this question. Yeah, speaking from my uh, my investigation and what I got uh, so far, because this is not uh, something new in our projects, I think the most important thing is to like establish and like or promoting the, the the public spaces, whether it is closed. As I mentioned earlier, we can like promote the mosques for, for these dialogues. It is possible because we are giving to the mosques. We are establishing a, a dialogue. We are not trying to practice our religious rituals. Uh, which is 
different from Muslims, we are trying to establish a dialogue, just communication. That's the first, I think, to destroy the or to like to to destroy the barrier, the mental barrier that I mentioned very earlier, and also infuse the the heritage or the the, the values of the others in the in the in the education system from the beginning, which is very important and it is quite possible, but it's doable. Uh, for example, if, if, if when, when I was a kid, uh, I didn't know about the Christians and I thought that they are like some kind of different species. But if, if you give, give me an idea that they have the same uh, goals and objectives and they have the same languages, also they have a high standard like heritage or values. So it is easier for me when I grow up to, to reach them, to meet them, to have this kind of empathy them on also uh, on, on, on the on the bigger level what just you see that is the the, the 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 right or the most powerful tool to to uh, revalidize this this empathy which is like uh, like documentation or what what is we say working or or, or promoting the, the 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 heritage or the values of yourself and the others in order to make this kind possible because Unfortunately, because of the, the continuous struggle, people are forgetting about what, what, what you have, what, what is going on in your community, what's going on in your house. But if we could just bring those small things on the table, then suddenly we realize that also we have problems, we have emotions, we have tragedies, we have stories. Then with, with this potential, with, with, with this potential, uh, then we can have a common ground with, with, with the other, then we can have a common ground for dialogue and empathy. Thank you, Rainbar. Nirvana, uh, the issue of social media came up several times so far in this conversation. And when we spoke yesterday, you mentioned that uh, the social media space itself is kind of dominated and hijacked by some of the forces that you described as um, as uh, tormentors of those who would advance empathy. Um, can you envision um, the beginnings of an effort to reclaim that space um, in the name of uh, empathic dialogue? Indeed, uh, thank you, Joseph. Um, uh, two comments before I talk about social media. First of all, I acknowledge what Hossein said that uh, uh, it's not necessarily the Ottomans who started the problem, but I meant that they are the one who paved the, the, the modern phenomena of it, uh, rather than dwelling on the uh, medieval aspect of, of that phenomena. And a lot of Islamists, even they agree with the Ottomans or not, they see the Ottoman Empire as a model of the modern society in a Muslim world. And that's the part I see it as alarming. Number two, I'm glad that you see mentioned the communities abroad, because one of the things I'm, I worried about is the spreading of the isolation by, by transplantation policy. So we move the Shia mix with their own groups in the West. The, the Christian do the same, the uh, Jews, uh, the Muslim. So. I worry that if we want to start, we have to start with fighting the problem of lack of empathy and isolation within the various diaspora groups in, uh, in, in the Western world. Yes, there are positive aspects and sometimes groups mix, etc. So I'm not denying that, but I am also the more wave of uh, immigration, the more risk of rising isolation. And hence, that's why I talk about social media. Social media bring us apart, uh, bring us together. Social media bring across the borders and make the people who live in the diaspora mix and understand the, the native people in their own communities and, and, and understand their problems. But I, I think the main problem we have is that a lot of people are happy to speak on social media, but not necessarily to listen to the others. So you found people hijack the conversation and write their own views and then block the others or, or start insulting them when they start to mention something different to their narratives. And that's the bit I, uh, I feel it is a starting point. 
first, we have to uh, believe that empathy is a project that we need to defend. And number two, to be aware of the pitfall and stand firm against those who are trying to uh, attack us. So if you are engaging in a conversation with the Jews, they call you Zionist. Uh, and Zionist is not believing in the project of Israel. Zionist become like an insult in the, in the Middle East, as if you are a traitor, you are a bad person. And I'm sorry for you, see, I, I don't mean it in a bad way. I'm just trying to explain what actually happened in social media. Uh, I've been called uh, a Zionist for even uh, talking about uh, the, the pitfall of the Arab Spring. So here is a problem. Uh, the other issue is um, engaging with government in the region. Uh, and I understand the pitfall of that. Uh, we have, in my views, there are gray is not a color we like in the Middle East. That's why we usually tend to simplify things into friends and foe, uh, enemies or, or, or loyal people. Uh, and so the, maybe the, 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 the Shia are the bad one or the Jewish people or the pro-Israel are the bad one, etc. or the women or the Copt or whatever. We have to acknowledge that we have 50 shades of greys in social issues and in political issues, but also we have 50 shades or God knows how many of authoritarianism in the region. And those, this authoritarianism is, uh, we have the one which are not, we cannot engage with like the regime in Iran or, uh, or other parts. I, I don't want to specifically mention a country, but also there are regimes who are certainly not democratic, but they are aware of certain phenomena who they want to work on to improve in the society for their own agenda. But I believe in for as a starting point, I don't think it's bad to engage with those regimes to try to improve uh, the education because I believe in long term, the more we prepare the society for the societies in the Middle East for empathy by education, by engaging in social tools, etc. The, the day after uh, 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 the end of any authoritarian regime will be better. Uh, if any prob anything we learn from the Arab Spring, that the end of an authoritarian regime uh, is not a start of a rosy period. In fact, it's a start of a lot of more turbulence and tendency to revert to authoritarianism as a, a way forward. And to avoid that and to defend our goal of in spreading empathy, we need to pave the, the way forward through working through with the society, even if it's not perfect, even if it's not democratic, and encourage listening. The more we listen to each other, the more empathy will prevail. Thank you, Nirvana. Hussein, I'm sure you view, uh, agree with uh, Nirvana's view that uh, there are conduits to channel uh, the type of cosmopolitan worldview that you and other uh, diaspora Lebanese figures have long embraced into the interior, uh, through, whether it be through social media or other forms of uh, uh, broadcast and other communication. I'm wondering whether you feel that such an approach could actually catalyze um, a kind of change on the ground in Lebanon, in the places that you want to reach. Can it dr inspire people to actually uh, muster the courage um, to overcome the stigma on uh, empathic engagement inside the country? Well, the diaspora can certainly play a role. Um, so far in the past, and over the past decades, there have been a few experiments uh, over you know, uh, things on how different groups can talk to one another. During the Lebanese Civil War and also in Iraq these days, you often see uh, interfaith dialogue and communities coming together. And these are usually clerics and they hold uh, joint prayer sessions and uh, they try to, uh, to highlight what they have in common, uh, whether it's monotheism or Abraham, the patriarch as an ancestor uh, and these kind of things. I haven't seen really uh, very robust results or positive outcome coming out of those. After the Lebanese Civil War, there were many uh, NGOs that tried to uh, uh, start programs of uh, war fighters, previous fighters who were repenting and who were talking to one another. And these offered a more successful 
uh, experiment uh, only because fighters are usually or be become uh, more hesitant, hesitant to engage in conflict because of all the, the war and fighting and blood they've witnessed while they were fighting. So these uh, tend, to be, t tend to become peaceful. They talk to one another. They used to be fighters who fought ferociously against one another and now, now they're talking. But even this model, the, uh, the dialogue uh, has been limited. Uh, the third uh, way I can think of is, is if the diaspora can offer uh, a role model for anyone who still lives in these countries and who deep down inside believes in peace and dialogue. Uh, when these people see that there are other Sunni or Shia or Jews or Christians or whoever in, in the wider world who embrace uh, ideas of peace and normalization and dialogue, this might be some sort of, of a push for them to come out. It's, it's really hard if you live in, in a monolithic segregated village, it's hard to come out and say, well, guess what? I like the Sunnis if you're Shia, or I like the Jews or like the Christians. You'll be shamed, you'll be socially isolated. Um, you know, there, there'll be all kinds of, of prices that you'll have to pay. So I'd say that if the diaspora can keep on pushing, if the diaspora does not endorse the same uh, rhetoric that's being peddled by the groups in their countries, if they come up with more peaceful and tolerant dialogue, I think that might reflect well, that might push and sponsor some of the young people who are coming, you know, who are coming of age now to endorse such model of tolerance. Thank you, Hussein. Uh, Roya, I think that's a great bridge to sort of the beginnings of a prescriptive uh, vision um, of the problem that you described, right? So in Iran, if there is hope for um, fomenting this type of empathic engagement, it surely rests in large part, at least right now, on uh, the Iranian diaspora getting its act together and modeling uh, the type of exchange uh, that is needed. And um, you're concerned that it, it hasn't uh, stepped up to the plate. And so tell us how you would, how you would address that problem. Um, before, before I uh, get to answer your question, I just want to tell everyone of an, an anecdote that was um, and remains one of the most moving experiences of my own life. And I think it will um, uh, elucidate the point that I'm trying to make better than any other thing I could possibly formulate. Um, I had been invited to speak uh, in Toronto on a panel and, um, and once I was done, another group of people came on the stage. It was uh, a conference organized by the Iranian diaspora in, in Toronto. And on the stage uh, was a Baha'i Iranian um, and two or three other families whose uh, children had been executed or uh, were missing uh, because they had been political ac activists in Iran. The Baha'i woman um, who had lost her husband, um, her husband had been um, apprehended by the Iranian security forces and taken away in a very violent scene on the streets of the uh, city where they lived. Um, in a, uh, and, and she was describing the scene of her husband being taken away. And this is a hall of three or 400 people. She is uh, sobbing on the stage, narrating the scene of this apprehension. And in the middle of her telling, someone at the very end of the hall among the audience got up and said, I was there. And he started sobbing at the end of the hall. And he started saying, I was there, that night changed me. I have been carrying the grief uh, of not having intervened or done anything to, to, uh, to get in the way of, of your husband being taken away. I revisit that moment uh, so often in my own life. And I can't tell you um, what happened before this or after this at the conference. But this is including whatever it was that I said, because this is the only thing that I remember. And I think this is the only thing that everyone else took away from that conference. 
And it wasn't that they reconciled or he said that he was a Shiite person or she said what it was like to be a Baha'i or, or anything. It was just the fact that these two strangers came together so authentically over an incident that had changed both their lives. And what I'm trying to say is that we know why we can't have a conversation in Iran or maybe in Iraq or obviously Egypt. But the fact is this bizarre situation of being in exile now provides us with the opportunity that we don't have in those countries where these problems are rampant. And, and when a, a situation like this occurs where we can simply hear each other, not even solve a problem, but just listen to each other. It is a transforming experience. And it was for me, and I can assure you that it was for everyone else in that hall that evening. And it was, it, it was just, you know, speaking of empathy, it was the most em empathetic effort that you could put um, toward, toward reconciling, you know, the Baha'is and the Shiites and all that. So what I think we ought to do is we, we, should, we should take a second look at the issue of diaspora um, and not think of diaspora as a wasted community, but, but as a microcosm that can be really useful and, and essential in creating everything that we hope to replicate later on. And how can that be done? You know, conferences um, are examples, you know, simply situations where people who never listen to each other or haven't told their own stories, uh, communicating, talking to each other. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of broadcasts, um, you know, TV, radio, thanks to social media, there are all sorts of, you know, other possibilities that exist now. And I think all we have to do is not even try to reconcile people together, but just provide an opportunity for those whose narratives have been hijacked by others to speak of their own experiences in their own words. Thank you, Bruya. I'm deeply heartened by uh, each of you and each of what you brought to this conversation. Uh, what we've just done is adopt the format that a think tank in Washington or Paris or elsewhere might use to talk about tanks and guns and uh, promoting employment uh, as a means to foster peace and so many other uh, kinetic or material approaches to conflict resolution. The Center for Peace Communications is devoted to the principle that empathy and civility are just as powerful a force in mitigating conflict. And uh, we think that there should be policies and plans and, and uh, great effort designed to take an example like uh, Yossi's experience uh, or the insights that each of you uh, has brought through your own writing and activism uh, and really systematizing it uh, for the benefit of the region. Um, so this actually is our first independent webinar as an organization, and I'm so glad that uh, each of you has been a part of it. And uh, I just want to signal that we are committed um, to translating these ideas into actual practice. Um, so thank you all, um, and, um, and let's be in touch again very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Really thank you, everyone.